a really adverse situation. So, you know, I think we're always trying to get positive yards on first and second down to make sure you can get into workable third downs, and you want to make sure that you're taking care of the football. And I asked Ryan, obviously you want to be able to run the football in a game <clears> in Nebraska, so you're running it and trying to develop that and, and grow that. At what point in that game do you have to say, okay, we've just got to go win the football game? And how does that change the play call? Yeah, I, I don't think it changes the play call because our game plan going into the Nebraska game is that we have to run the football to develop our running game. Like, we're not – we're at a point where we're not trying to develop anything right now. We're trying to win football games. So, you know, what's our best What's our best chance against what they're doing? And then, obviously, you can have plans going into the week, but sometimes that plan changes as the game starts to express itself, as you start to see, you know, what the matchups are like. You have an understanding going into the game what you think the matchups are like, but they're not, they may not be what you think they are as the game goes along. So then you have to adjust within the game. Uh, Jeremy Birmingham of the podcast. Chip, is there, as you head into a weekend like this where you know you're going to probably see a lot of pressure <clears throat> Again, you're talking team-specific, you know, uh, scenarios. But does that maybe force Will to be more involved in the run game? That, like as you head into these days of practice, is that something that you're thinking about? Because it seems I think it depends on who you're playing and what they're doing. You know, sometimes people generate pressure by just rushing four guys. You know, and that doesn't, and they're playing coverage behind it, and they can do a good job of taking care of your quarterback. Other people's version of pressure is to blitz seven or eight guys and and there's an opportunity <clears throat> at those times when there's a a hole in what they're bringing at you that you can you can pop something like that so again I think it depends on each team you know the one thing I know about this team is that they're they're extremely sound you know they they can generate pressure with just their front four um, and I think that's one of their strengths you know I think their two defensive ends are as good as we'll face um, they got a really good interior defensive tackle in Durant that that can generate pass rush. So, you know, I think the luxury when you have a when you have a defense where you can generate pressure with just the front four, then you can play a little bit more coverage, play a little bit closer to receivers because you think those four guys are going to come home. So their their blitz percentages aren't as high as some of the teams that we play because those four guys up front can generate that pressure. The traditional run game doesn't wasn't getting off, really getting going on Saturday. Do you start to think like maybe we just run? throw in something more for Will to throw people off, or how does that work? You think about a lot of things when things aren't working, so yes. But I also, it's, it's what you practice and against the looks that the different team presents. So, the, you know, you couldn't be more drastic in terms of um, looks than what Nebraska runs and what Penn State runs. So it's, you know, two, it's an entirely different thought process as you flip into this week against Penn State. Cameron T. Robinson, The Athletic. Chip, you, you've been pretty innovative and versatile with your offense in your career. When you look at what Cole Mickey's doing at Penn State and what they have going with Tyler Warren, just what, what are your thoughts on, on, on what I haven't have? watched a ton of them. I watched a lot of them when he was at Kansas last year, but we haven't. I'm not defending him, so Jim and those guys on defense have, have spent more time studying him. You know, you, in season – isn't a time where you're trying to study guys and say, hey, let's look at this and let's run that. Um, you know, it's more of who are we playing? You know, what is Tom Allen presenting with the defense that, that Penn State has and how are we going to attack that? But, you know, I, I really liked what he did at, at Kansas um, and did some really interesting things there. And it sounds like he's doing some of the similar things at, at Penn State. Andy Backstrom, Letterman Rowe. Yeah, uh, yeah, Chip. What makes Abdul Carter just so disruptive? You talked to him this season about Dylan Birch, just I know every defense end or edge rusher is different. What is it about Abdul that yeah. separates him? He's extremely explosive for his size. You know, he's he's got you know, he's played linebacker before and then now they moved him to the front. Um, you know, he's a lot like Micah in terms of what he can do and disrupting the game for, as a pass rusher and understand why they moved him up there. But I think it's his athleticism that you you probably don't see that athleticism usually in a defensive lineman um, that you get from him. And that's the one thing, you know, even trying to replicate that in practice, do you have somebody that's that fast? You know, if you do, he's probably not the same size as him. So, you know, it's that size speed combination and his ability to, to really get off on the snap is, is what's going to make him difficult to handle. And we got to make sure we, we understand where he is. They've done a decent job. You know, he, he had been predominantly playing on one side, but in the Wisconsin game, they moved him to the other side. So they, they could put him on either side. And um, we need to be aware of where he is. Bill Landis, Kings of the North. Chip, there's been a, an uptick the last two games you guys have played and just runs kind of stopped at or behind the line of scrimmage. <clears throat> have you identified anything there, call-wise, execution-wise, that you guys need to iron out going into this game? 
Yeah, I mean, we can't we can't live with the way we, we ran the ball last week, and so that's part of what we have to do heading into this game because you, you're going to have to win the rushing battle to win games in the Big Ten, so we certainly understand that. Again, like I said earlier, Penn State's defense is different than Nebraska's, so things that you would do against Penn State are different than things you would do against Nebraska, but we're, you're right in that we have to establish establish a run in this game. Can't just like snap your fingers and generate an explosive. You run wish play. you could. Though, I know you wish you could. <laughs> you, but you guys were were good at getting those you know explosive run plays earlier on in the year. I understand you play better defense. It's more it's more mm -hmm. challenging. But how how much is that on your mind? I guess trying to find ways to be more explosive. Yeah, the the, the the your mind is just how how can we be successful? And then success is generating first downs. You know, and the way you generate first downs is to make put yourself in convertible third down situations or actually convert on first and second down and not even be in third down. So it's really, you know, what's our efficiency like on first and second down so we can put ourselves in a, a workable third down situation. Stephen Means, Cleveland.com. I, I know you missed all of what Josh Simmons was for you as a left tackle, but mm -hmm. where does his absence show up more in the run game or in the passing game as a pass program? I think in both because Josh was not just a one-dimensional player. You know, he was a, a really, really talented player that's going to play football on Sundays, you know, and, and – you know, as a pass protector, his athleticism was, you know, as, as good as it was in the country. But his also his quickness and his ability to get out of the stance um, and get his hands on people was was a real asset for us in the run game. So you, you know, you miss both of that with Josh. He wasn't just a one-dimensional player. So um, he's back in the building now and he's running around, got a smile on his face, which we're happy for. And I hope he he's off to a full recovery. But um, you know, you, when you miss a player of, of Josh's talent, um, you know, that's going to hurt. But we got to step up and we got to go on and we got to we got to move on because everybody at this point in time has had injuries so um, and has lost somebody at at some point some point in time depending on position but everybody's lost somebody at this point in time and that's what this we knew going into this you know if you're going to be playing a 16 or 17 game season that there's going to be some attrition that happens and um, who it is you don't know but you got to be able to weather that storm if you're going to be successful. Can you just <clears throat> evaluate where you think your offensive line depth is right now that you spent three weeks? Watching it without Josh and obviously some other injuries, but also get the chance to see some of these guys playing meaningful snaps. And where you think your offensive line is right now? Yeah, they're where we need them to be right now because that's who we have. You know, this isn't the National Football League where if you do lose somebody, you can go out to the waiver wire and go find another player at that position. It's you got to be able to handle it at your position. You know, we've lost a really good one in Josh, and then everybody else is fighting and scrapping to stay in there. You know, a bunch of guys when you've played this many games during the season are are banged up and bruised up a little bit, but that's. So aren't they, you know, and that's the same thing that, that Penn State's probably dealing with, the same thing that we're dealing with. So um, it's part of the game, and we don't look at it as, you know, boy, you got to feel sorry for us because we lost some players. It's That's the reality of what college football is, and it's a team that can survive and advance um, despite losing a player or two that, that are going to be successful. Austin Ward, the podcast. Chip, I know that this is a lot easier for me to, to say in hindsight and in my position. When you're struggling to run the football and you're trying to find a solution, like you said, to just win the game, why is that not as easy as Jeremiah, Mecca, or Carnell? Like, maybe we're just going to throw this game. I think if you look at Jeremiah, Mecca, and Carnell, they came up big, especially in that, you know, you look at that drive we had to get in the fourth quarter, and it started off with Carnell making a huge catch for us for 30-plus yard gains. You know, and I think when, when – um, but it's not as easy as what you're saying because if they're going to play coverage over the top of them, then sometimes you can take an individual receiver away. So um, – we, we, if you look at Saturday's game, we just got to do a better job on third down. If we didn't really convert the third and shorts, we had a third and one we missed. We had a third and two we missed. We had a third and three we missed. We had a fourth and one we missed. If we converted it, converted in short yardage situations, I think it would have been a different outcome. But that's we have to be better in short yardage. And obviously this week, that's, that's a big part of the game plan. Joey Kaufman, Columbus Dispatch. Chip, uh, Jeremiah came in here with high expectations, and, and for him to – be freshman and kind of produce week in and week out. What do you think allowed him to do that? Yeah, I, I think there's a maturity to Jeremiah that most freshmen um, or most people don't have. You know, especially at that age, like his, he is as serious a football player as, as I've been around, and his goal every single day is just to improve, and it's just to, for him to get better at at one facet of the game. And I think it's a it's almost like you're dealing with a ten year NFL veteran in terms of how he approaches meetings, how he approaches practice. Um, and it's it's really it's rare, you know. And that's the first thing I said. Obviously, when you meet Jeremiah, his physical skills are they're kind of incomparable for someone at that age. But I think it's his maturity level that that really has set him apart, you know. And that his mindset is 
you know, because there's a lot of guys that could get caught up in that, in the hype and everything, talking about him and all the people they're comparing him to and all that. But you don't see that out of him. You know, he's the one guy that practices every single day. And and if Coach Hart hold, holds him out for a play for some reason, like he, he's genuinely not happy. Like he wants to practice, he wants to play. And I think really it's his mindset that kind of sets him apart and makes him such a special player. Teams at all defended him differently as the seasons. People have, right? you know, have leaned safeties to him and try to get people over the top of him. And I think we moved him around a little bit. The, the play he scored a touchdown on, he was lined up inside at receiver and not outside at receiver, and we were able to get him through the middle of the field. So as he's been around, the longer we've been around, we've had a chance to move him around a little bit. And I think that's obviously eventually the plan when you have a good receiver and you just leave him in the same spot all the time. It's 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 a lot easier to defend him. So his ability to grasp game plans and, and allow us to move him around like he does is is another credit to him. Uh, far left, Whitney Hardy, WCME. Um, three weekends ago, you guys were on the road, top four matchup, and came up just short. Mm -hmm. Now here we are again, on the road, top four matchup. How do you see this as a, a chance to, redeem isn't the right word, but an exciting opportunity to kind of show like, yes, we can win these tough, close matchup games like this? Yeah, I don't think you compare either game to each other because I think they're their own separate entities. But, you know, when you look at the schedule and you know you're playing Penn State at Penn State, that's that's enough to get you excited. You know, that's why you play. And that's why you came to school here is to play in games like this. Um, but you came in, you came in here to, to win games like this. So it's it's about our preparation. I think this group is it's a little bit of an older group. So I think they they handle how to practice each week really, really well. I think this team practices really, really well. So, you know, it all starts for us because today's our first day is having a really, really good Tuesday, having a good Tuesday in meetings, having a good Tuesday on, on, the, on the practice field, you know, and then learning as we start to implement what our game plan is. Now, I don't know if you heard Will's comments after the last game about how he feels going into this game. Um, being from Pennsylvania, he said he's stoked. Um, he always wanted to play there. And he, in his words, maybe wasn't good enough and he hopes to show that he was. Do you hope that kind of juice kind of infiltrates the rest of the team going into this week? Yeah, I, I think our team is, is, is extremely intrinsically motivated, and it doesn't take because Will's going back home for – Treshawn to say, all right, now I'm going to take this game a little bit more seriously. I mean, you watch how he practices and how he prepares. You know, he takes every game serious, and I think he sets a tone. So that older group, Will, Trey, Donnie, those guys that have been around and played a lot of football in their in their college careers understand the magnitude of this football game. Uh, Tim May, uh, Letterman Row. Last question. Yeah. No, no, no. Oh, that's, <laughs> I thought that was a tradition. Yeah, no, I was hoping it was a tradition. <laughs> Uh, is it, so the motto this week isn't where there's a will, there's a way. I'm, I'm just being smart. Uh, uh, That's a good one. You should get a T-shirt, maybe. Yeah, no. Uh, NIL. You, as you, yeah, there you go. As you look back on last week, I mean, the Oregon game, speaking of that, a lot of short yard situations. Y'all even got into robust T is what I call it. Uh, one time, I think, in the middle of the field and stuff. Mm -hmm. and two backs, or two backs look anyway a lot and stuff. I don't remember seeing that if at all, on Saturday and stuff. And I'm just wondering, as you're sitting there in the press box, are you continually going through your mental Rolodex about how do we get this fixed? I mean, what's going on here? Is it, is, are guys just missing blocks? Or are guys not recognizing fronts? I mean, just how was that all you yeah. know, as you were trying to solve that puzzle? I think like any staff, you have a list of – what your short yardage game plan is going into that game, which is specific for the team that you're playing. So something that you may have run against Oregon isn't even in the game plan that you ran against Nebraska just because how they deploy their front on a short yardage situation is is entirely different than how Oregon deployed their front. So what, one play that worked against one team may not work against another team. So, you know, there's really – a list is when we get the short yardage, we're going here first, here second, here third, and then working through that that operation. But you know, we we ran a quarterback sneak. You know, the first time we ran it, we were in uh, a condensed set with tight ends and wings, and and uh, brought every brought the receiver back down into the mix. So there there really were no sped receivers on that play. The second time we ran, we ran an empty look, and we ran a quarterback sneak. So you know, we and we also ran another quarterback sneak coming out of our own one yard line. But we did that with three tight ends in the game. So you know, as you go through it, there's a list of things that we practice during the week and. We're, we're calling what we do on Saturday based upon what we did during the week because of who our opponent is. And, and so, but when you come off a game like that, where you're, where literally the uh, the uh, work on third down was poor. You know what I mean? The con convergence mm -hmm. on third down was poor. Do you just throw that in the trash? I mean, what? You know what I mean? What, well, I guess what I'm asking is, what do you think y'all got wrong in that respect? Because all of a sudden it came right on the last drive, of course. Yeah, and I, that's 
football. You know, I don't think there's there's not one perfect play call to call all the time. If you did, everybody would do it. You know, I think it's it's a combination of the situation, what happened, what, what was the snap count, what formation were we in, how did the defense react? Did they react the way that we thought they were going to react and put people in the places that we practiced what we thought they were going to be in? So it's all a combination of that. When you're going to be successful on third down, it takes it takes a lot of work and takes all 11 guys and the play caller being on the same page. Bill Rabinowitz, Columbus Dispatch. Chip, you said, Ryan has said many times, that there's no waiver wire in college football. Um, mm -hmm. He lost Josh Simmons, obviously. This champion, this team still has the same championship aspirations it always has. Of sure. Course. How confident are you as an offensive coordinator that this offensive line as it is right now can take you there? I'm very confident. Uh, I, I watch those guys every day, and I think there's a really good group of guys. We lost one in a, in a really good one in Josh, but you know there's a bunch of other guys there that I think are really, really good football players. So I think we're really confident and excited about this challenge that Penn State presents for us. And if Donovan has to move to left tackle, um, what's your level of confidence with him? Obviously, he's a very good guard. Mm -hmm. Never played tackle uh, in a game. Yeah, I think Donnie could play anywhere on the offensive line. He's that type of player, and I think um, – the best combination is, you know, I think first off, got to find out exactly who's healthy by the time game time rolls around, and then we'll we'll, we'll put together what we think is going to give us our best opportunity there. But we're extremely confident in Donnie if he if he had to go there. And final question, Tony Gerbin, Buckeye Huddle. Uh, Chip, um, the aside from the two runs for 70 yards for Travion against Oregon, Travion and Quinchon have averaged about two yards a carry the last two games. Is there any common de de denominator there for why? I wouldn't say there's a common denominator. I think on each specific play, there's probably a reason. Is it a, a missed block or a misread, or did we, you know, have a, a check that we're supposed to do? Because so there's always a lot of different different reasons for it. If there was, then it would be easily you, you wouldn't you wouldn't do it again. You know what I mean? Does that make you feel better or worse about it than I guess if it's if it's well, you don't feel good at all whenever you it's not whenever you don't convert when you when you feel like you should be converting. So. Um, but it's it's all of us, and it starts with me as a play caller to put ourselves in situations where they have an opportunity to be successful. So that's part of why what we do during the week in terms of putting game plans together. And with Will, how much of last week did, did he have the opportunity to read more, keep more, or keep as much as he has in previous games, or were those more handoffs? No, there's there's probably the same fair share in every game, but it also depends. I think you know when people maybe a misconception is well you got to run the quarterback more, but if that defensive end doesn't squeeze down and allow the quarterback to run, then they're allowing you to hand the football off. So they, they want you to hand the football off. So, it, you know, a lot of that part of the game, just in that specific play on zone replays, is that not every zone replay does the quarterback keep the football because if the defensive end does not close down, that's his read, then his job is to hand the ball off. So, it, again, if you're on defense, you could try to take away a lot of different things. It's just, you know, what do you want to take away? We, we, don't, we haven't had many specific just straight snap the ball to the quarterback and have him run the – quarterback power, you know, like Tim Tebow would do back in the day. That's not what we are with him. But I think he can hurt people with his feet, and he he has. Um, but you're also leery of when you have a quarterback is that's great. And then he has a gain of 20 and gets knocked out of the game. So now one of the best abilities of a quarterback is availability. So do you expose him? That's why besides Lamar Jackson, you don't see much run in the NFL because you pay a guy $24 million to throw the football around. You don't want to have him running around and getting hit in the head and then knocked out of the game because – you know, it's a physical football game, so there's a there's a fine balance of that. It's easy to say, well, we should just run the quarterback more. Okay, but what does that do, and what toll does that take on the quarterback? And if that happens, then is your quarterback knocked out of the game? And if that's the situation, then, you know, what does that do? How does your offense change, or does it change if or you go on to the next guy? So that's the dilemma, I think, that every football coach has when you have a quarterback that has the ability to run, is that how much do you want to run him? And expose him to hits because that's part of what happens because when he drops back he's going to get hit you know I think there's there's a lot of shots that quarterbacks take that you know it's a really really tough position to play just because of the, the toll that it takes on your body so you got to be conscious of that a little bit in terms of saying hey all right let's just come out and say we're going to run the ball we're going to run Wilf 25 times against Penn State well all right you know is he going to be available for the rest of the season I don't, I don't know about that so coach thank you